of, of Hayden, Jenna Thieves' uh, brother, went to California too. They're all out in Los Angeles. And uh, obviously Genevieve is 95 and she couldn't make the trip, but she's been in touch with everybody and sending her all the stuff and that sort of thing. So anyway, we do have some, some living descendants of Walter uh, T. Bailey. The unique thing is, this is like finding your roots. You ever watch that show on PBS with Dr. Henry Louis Gates, you know, where they go back and find your uh, relatives? And uh, when Joy contacted each of these women, Genevieve, who's 95, and Tara, who's in her 30s, First of all, they thought it was a prank phone call because none of them had ever heard of Walter T. Bailey. Guess what? They weren't the only ones. And, uh, and none of them uh, knew about each other. The family had kind of spread apart. Everybody asks, uh, whatever happened to them? Why is nobody here today? Essentially, Walter went away and did great things elsewhere. Uh, the family uh, pretty much petered out in the 40s. The ones that were here living died. There was a, uh, one of Genevieve's brothers who would be Walter's nephew lived here until 1968 when he died, but after that, the family just dried up here, now, uh, that part of the Baileys. There are other Baileys that went to Kiwani High School. There was a Bill Bailey and a few others, but they were completely different as far as we know. Uh, Steve could probably speak to that. But anyway, this was the family that we found. We were so glad, and then Tara was able to come back. They flew into Chicago yesterday. They went around and looked at some of Walter Bailey's sites that he built in Chicago, and they were down here today. They were at the, at the mural down there. Uh, there, uh, there was a video on, on Facebook of Tara actually painting on the thing, and they are just decide themselves, or she is anyway, as Joy can attest, she's on cloud nine because maybe she can relate to this a little bit more. She uh, knew none of this. Uh, well, tell us, uh, Joy, you talked to her down there today about, about Tara uh, Bailey. Uh, she is a professor at USC. She's in music history or something. A uh, very nice lady. Um, yeah, okay. My turn. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, Tara, uh, like I said, we found her on Facebook, the, the I call them the Scooby Squad. They they searched for her and found her, and I, I hit her up with a message, and I was like, are you the Tara Bailey that I'm looking for? And I gave a few little identifying things. What's your dad's name? What's your mom's name? And she calls me at 8 o'clock California time, which was about noon Eastern, and said, yes, I am. Please tell me everything. <laughs> and I just related her entire family tree on her grandfather's side that she just didn't know um, because of... She grew up in California. Her grandmother did not talk about where they all came from, so it was a complete surprise for her. So she um, she came to the mural today, and she said she was basically without words. She I think she she had sunglasses on. But I think she was crying. Um, and then we'll ask her to talk when she oh, comes yeah. about how this is gonna how this has affected her. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think I see shadows. No, okay. Um, we're keeping an eye out. She said she's close. Does she know where she's going? She said she was almost there. So maybe they're looking for a parking space. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, she she got to paint on the murals. That was one of the first things she wanted to do. Her mother was with her uh, painters running around. He's a great little dude. So uh, we've yeah, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say. It was just a really cool moment. Yeah. You know? Well, the other thing we can kind of get out of the way is kind of an, an old thing too. Uh, it's kind of reiterating what we know that she probably doesn't and, and or maybe really cares that much about. But that's the that's the wall dog's experience itself. And I just saw Danny walk in. Is Diane, I saw Diane walking around here somewhere. She's actually back. 2013, they were looking, well, actually a couple of years before that, they were looking, and correct me if I'm wrong here, anybody, but they were more involved than I was. But they were looking for a, a, something unique to uh, bring tourism to Kiwani. And Diane had had experience with uh, the wall dogs doing murals in Pontiac where she grew up. So they were contacted, they came here for a whole week, we had what, seven, it was 150, 200 artists from all over the world came here. They, they pick one town in the Midwest uh, every year and come and just spend the week and they do all these historical murals. The two rules are the subject uh, has to be dead and second of all it can't be a business, otherwise that's an ad. An existing business. Right. And one of the neat things about this, then of course the following year, the first year of the Prairie Chicken Festival, which we're celebrating now, uh, they, they did the Neville Brand mural down here. So this is the, that was the 20th anniversary of Wall Dogs when they came here in 2013. And this is the fifth year, uh, or it's been five years since we did the original set of mirrors. So there'll be tours Friday and Saturday night from 5 to 9 p.m. starting down at the CSB North on 3rd and Main. So come on down and, and we got air conditioned uh, minivans from the Villages Plus so you can, won't, you know, won't have we'll too much We'll meet behind the branch in Pardon? the parking lot. We'll meet at the parking lot. Not you know, where I said before. At the CSB? It, it, yeah, at the CSB. Same day, but in their parking lot. Right. 
But that, that, if you wind up at Third and Main at, at between five and nine, they'll, they'll find a place for you to sit down. So anyway, how did this all get started? I'm sorry, but Mike wanted to kick off with that, but we're, we're, we're waiting. Yeah, we're waiting. We'll, we'll wait a little bit longer, and then we'll just go ahead and start, and we can show it to her later if we have to. But but basically, this was one of those things that. Uh, uh, I'm just seeing if she texted me. Is all. <laughs> this was one of those things that sort of uh, fell out of the sky, literally. The one thing that Joy found when she contacted everybody from universities to architectural societies to historical groups in Arkansas, whatever was that every single one of them, to a man, woman, and child, knew instantly who Walter Thomas Bailey was. And nobody in Kiwani had the slightest clue, which is what makes this mural probably unique in several ways. One, because it's the only one we're doing this year, we've had more time to really delve into and do the story about this person that we're doing the mural on. But also, uh, we've created history. We have gone back and did, you know, the, the great ones that we did in 2013 on the Kiwani Fire, on the Dreamland Theater, on, uh, on the, the authors, on Roger Riemann and so forth, were all great subjects, but they were ones that we all were familiar with, and that's kind of how they were picked. Uh, this thing fell out of the sky. Every Monday I go to the Kiwani Public Library and look for uh, uh, things for the yesteryear's column. And in July of 2005, I stumbled across this story about this young man from Kiwani named Walter T. Bailey who had been appointed head of the School of Architecture at Tuskegee Institute by Booker T. Washington. A couple of bells went off, Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee, but who the heck is Walter Bailey? So anyway, that's where it all started and then later on, Joy claims that I wrote somewhere that you know we did a Neville Brand mural, now what are we doing about Walter Bailey? And everybody goes, Walter who? You know, everybody can think of so many. And here, here again, a plug for the, the suggestion box. If you have ideas for murals, we've got a box over here with, with notepads and pencils. Write them down, put them in there. The way this all started, and Diane, please correct me if I'm wrong, in 2013, and Larry Locke was involved, they came up with, I think, 30 potential subjects. And then the Wall Dogs artists, the Wall Dogs Public Art, went through and picked the ones that they thought that would be the most artistic. Obviously, art is first, history is second uh, in all this. They want it to look nice and then pick a good location and that sort of thing. So anyway, um, that's why it, it, if this one had been done in 2013, it would have just blended in with the list of the other 15 and it would have been great, but it wouldn't have gotten the, we wouldn't have been able to do all the research that we did on. This started last September when, when Joy set up her, her GoFundMe page. And I got on board in January and uh, got wrapped into this thing, go, going down the Walter Bailey rabbit hole, as, uh, as uh, she uh, explains. Well, our guest of honor is uh, guests of honor are here tonight. Uh, Tara Bailey over here. And introduce, introduce the, the next generation here. Um, this is Painter, my son. And His name is Painter? It is. And you brought him to a Wall Dogs <laughs> event? <laughs> That's got to be his story. And how old? How old is Painter? He's 15 months. Well. And he's he's tired. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I saw him out working on the mural this afternoon. Yes, he's tired. <laughs> okay, let's get started. So uh, the first thing we want to do in introducing you to Walter T. Bailey on Walter T. Bailey Night here at the Prairie Chicken Festival is Mike DeWalt with the uh, Kiwani Historical Society has produced a video with the stuff that we've come up with, and that's going to pretty much tell us who Walter is. Okay, now, before we get started here, you know, the, the murals are great works of art. Um, I'm an accountant, so uh, I don't really know much about art or videography, but I have been doing um, a number of videos on Kiwani history, and Joy asked me to do one um, for social media for the most part and as a kickoff for the subject tonight. and so. Don't worry, it's only six minutes long, so um, if you fall asleep, you won't snore, probably. At the Kiwani Historical Society, we have artifacts, mementos, documents, and photos of Kiwani's past. This is the story of Walter Thomas Bailey, a Kiwanian who lived an extraordinary life. He was born in Kiwani in 1882 to Emmanuel and Lucinda Reynolds Bailey. 
Walter's father was born in Alabama in 1842 and his mother about that same time in Missouri. And since they were both born in the South in the 1840s, it's likely that both of Walter's parents were former slaves. They were married in 1869 in Illinois and had 10 children together, and Walter was the eighth. Walter was born, raised, and educated in Kewanee, Illinois. And he went to high school during the final few years of the 1800s, graduating in 1900. You know, it's hard to fathom how difficult it must have been for a young African-American man in the late 1800s. But by all indications, Walter was well-liked and an active high school student. He was in several clubs and was active in sports. In fact, in this photo from the fall of 1898, it shows Walter with the high school football team. He was a junior at the time and is in the front row of the photo. After graduating from Kewanee High School in 1900, Walter attended the University of Illinois in Champaign. He finished in four years and graduated with a bachelor's degree in architecture in 1904. Walter was the first African American to graduate from the university's architecture school and he became the first licensed African American architect in Illinois. 1904 saw another of life's milestones for young Mr. Bailey. He married Josephine McCurdy. Josephine was about a year younger than Walter and was born in 1883, and they were married in Champaign. The couple had two daughters. Edith, the oldest, was born in 1905, and Alberta came eight years later in 1913. Walter and Josephine moved back to Kiwani in 1905, and for a short time, Walter became a draftsman for local Kiwani architect Henry Eklund. At that time, Kiwani was growing rapidly, Western Tube, which later became Walworth, had nearly 5,000 employees, and Kiwani Boiler and Boss Manufacturing were growing, and Kiwani was home to a number of other manufacturing companies. As a draftsman for Mr. Eklund, we don't know much about what Walter worked on in Kiwani, except for the remodeling of apartments on the second floor of this building. After a short time in Kiwani, Walter and Josephine moved back to Champaign, and Walter worked for the architects Spencer and Temple. As was the case in Kiwani, we don't know too much about the buildings that he worked on other than Champaign's Colonel Wolf High School building. After a short stay in Champaign, later in 1905, Walter and Josephine made another move, and it was a big one, a major opportunity for young Walter Bailey. He was offered a position to head the Tuskegee Institute's Mechanical Industries Department. And he was offered that job by none other than Booker T. Washington himself. While at Tuskegee, Walter was an educator and an administrator. And he can be seen here in this picture with some of his students. The Tuskegee Institute was growing and Walter did more than teach. Walter designed several of the buildings at Tuskegee that are still in use today. Tuskegee, Walter designed buildings for other organizations. The First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama is a great example. After more than 10 years at Tuskegee, in 1916, Walter left to open his own architecture practice in Memphis, Tennessee. By all accounts, he was a success and designed a number of buildings. The Knights of Pythias, which was a non-sectarian fraternal organization open to African Americans, was a particularly good client of Walter's and he designed several buildings for him. <coughs> Walter was asked to design and build the National Pythian Temple in Chicago. It was a very substantial building and it caused Walter in 1924 to move his practice to Chicago to be closer <coughs> to the build. 
Later in Chicago in 1939, he built the first Church of Deliverance. It was in the Art Deco style and was on South Wabash Avenue. In 1941, Walter died at the age of 59. It was from pneumonia and caused by complications from heart disease. He was working on two projects at the time of his death. The first was an interior remodel of the Olivet Baptist Church, one of the most prominent African-American churches in Chicago. And the second was the Ida B. Wells Home, a large public housing project on Chicago's west side. Walter was rediscovered by his hometown a little over 10 years ago and will be remembered as a Kiwanian who lived an extraordinary life of accomplishment. about earlier about how this all all of that started uh, and this is up where I might ask Joy to, to come up here uh, obviously you know uh, we found we found this person back in 2005 uh, I did a, a column audit in February of 2006 uh, years years ago uh, it occurred to me that the history of Kiwani's african-american community had largely been uh, ignored or not been recorded. And so I started doing stories on various people and digging things out and so forth, creating history, digging it up in the past. Came up with some really great stories on, on really a, a great people, uh, did amazing things. So anyway, Joy picks up on this somehow, thinks this would be a good mural. So tell me, tell us, the gathered assembly here, why you, what inspired you to go from something on print about this guy that went to Tuskegee it, to, to put him up on the wall. It was an incredible story. Um, I work in TV, obviously, um, but we tell stories for a living. You know, I mean, that's what we, we call it when we're doing a news story. We're telling a story. And it's a good story, it's a bad story, but there's those feature stories, you know, that you watch, you know, Steve Hartman on CBS or something, where you're just like, oh, that's such a cool story. And that's what Walter's story was to me. It was a cool story. And when we did the 2013 mural meet, and I've been traveling around with the Bulldogs since then. I've gone to every meet since the 2015 one, or except for the 2015 one. I guess I just got back from Streeter, their 25th anniversary. But every single one of those murals is a story of that town, or a story on our town. The Kiwani fire, um, that one, I didn't know about that beforehand. I always kind of wondered why we had some like mid-century buildings with our older architecture downtown, and that totally answered that question for me. But you know, while I was looking at all those murals, I talked to a, an elderly lady that was looking at that one. And I said, What's, which one's your favorite? She goes, well, this one I remember because I was a little girl. I was seven years old and we thought that the Japanese had attacked us from Pearl Harbor <laughs> because the grown-ups were all running around and freaking out from the fire. But she told me this and it was just this really cool conversation. It brought it back, you know, that she, and she was very happy that we were all remembering. The people like me that had no idea that this happened. Um, now knew, and her history lived on, you know? And we didn't know about Walter, and now we do. And now we know about Walter's family, and they know about Walter too. And so we've told his story, and it was just a really compelling story. This guy, it, for me personally, he's just a month shy of 100 years old, older than me. We went to Kiwani High School 100 years exactly apart, 1896 to 1900, 1996 to 2000. So for me, that was that, that connection personally that, you know, wow, what was it like then? Oh, there's like 25 kids in his class, so there's 138 in mine, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Weathersfield was down the road, but, you know, there was that. It, I don't know, it was just really compelling that way, of, like, you know, from that perspective, in, in his shoes kind of a thing. But also, what he did with that. He... He, he had the whole, I'll show you attitude, and he showed us all, and that screams to me in that picture, that especially his, his portrait that's on the wall, but even his football photo or his, his high school picture, that he was a guy that was going places, and he knew he was going to go somewhere, and he knew he was going to do something awesome, 
And now his story will never be forgotten because it's on our wall, it's on the internet, it's everywhere. We all now know, and it lives on, and he lives on. So that's what I took out of your article. So wordsmith. She keeps telling me it's my fault. It so. is your fault. <laughs> uh, and the, what, as we got into this thing, we started wondering some things. Some things became rather curious to us. How can a, an African-American child in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a young man, the son of, of uh, ex-slaves who could neither read or write, uh, Emmanuel, uh, when he was alive, was listed in the census as a laborer and a domestic servant. Lucinda later on was listed as a housekeeper uh, and uh, she took in wash. Uh, the older brothers, Henry and Harry, his two older brothers, uh, became barbers, which was a big thing back in the day. Everybody got their hair cut, I guess. And, uh, but something didn't add up. Well, back then, uh, I, I gotta give a plug to the Kiwani Public Library, the Historical Society, and the Henry County Genealogical Society for digitizing all the old newspapers, which you can go, you, you, anybody in this room can go on the library website, click Kiwani Newspapers, bracket the dates, put in the subject, and you can find every single article ever written during that period of time about whatever, Walter Bailey, Dave Clark, whatever. And so that gave us a lot of information. He did everything at Kiwani High School. He was Mr. Cool. He was, he was a fullback on the football team, made touchdowns. He got invited to part, back then they wrote stories on the front page, Mike Hellenthal, about the, uh, the social events that the kids, so, some, some girl, Miss So-and-so had a party down on South Tremont Street, and the guests were. And they were all of white names, and here's Walter T. Bailey. Early on, uh, Emmanuel had his name with colored in parentheses afterwards, but by the time Walter came along, you wouldn't have known the difference unless you happened to know who Walter Bailey was to begin with. He was just accepted as part of, as one of the kids, and they accepted him. They invited him to social events. He was on the football team. Uh, and, and, but then we wondered, the University of Illinois thing really kind of threw me anyway. How in the, does this kid get from, keep in mind this is 1900. And I guess that's what you have to think about because we think of the U of I in 2018 terms. And you've got to go back to 1900. And the U of I was founded in 1867 and something key took place. Uh, it was a land grant college established by the Morrill Act in 1862 which gave land and gave money uh, for a state to set up an open college for everybody so they couldn't turn anybody away. In 1890, uh, there was a specific, a, a Morrill Act Number 2 passed that, that was, was preferential to, it was almost like affirmative action, so that African Americans could, couldn't be, or ex-slaves couldn't be denied you know, a, an education. The idea was that one college in every state would be for the working class, every guy, every girl, person to come. The tuition was zero. Oh. The uh, expenses were 100 to 200 dollars a year, but still, for a kid whose mom washes clothes, you know, how did he pay for this? Well, we finally came to the conclusion that he had the two barbers, the two older brothers, and the mom all had jobs that had incomes. And we're thinking that he became the family project. You know how it is where the youngest one, by God, you're gonna make something of yourself. And Lucinda probably hammered that into his head until, and the brothers helped him along and made sure he got, he had to have good, look at that senior picture we showed on there, the young picture of him. He's got a nice haircut, which I'm sure the brothers did. But he's got a nice jacket, he's got a nice collar. I mean, he's not some poor kid. Plus, in 1900, most boys either went to the factory to work on the farm or in dad's business. They didn't go to college. But uh, there was something exceptional about this class. There was 24 kids in it. All 24 went to a college, a trade school, or a, or a seminary. And seven of them, all boys, went to the University of Illinois in various things, engineering, architecture, whatever. And five of the seven wound up graduating at the end of four years, including Walter. And to accomplish that in 1900 is hard enough if you're white. But if you're a little black kid from Kiwani, you know, you wonder how in the world he did it. It must have been his drive, it must have been his family support, it must have been just his willingness. Okay, now why architecture? Now that we haven't quite figured out, but we figure it has to have something to do with Henry Eklund. Henry Eklund was a Swedish immigrant who came to the United States when he was 18. He, uh, the first thing we saw from him in the, the old newspapers was 1891. He and a partner named Sandberg were, were doing carpenter work on some shop up on North Main Street. 
1894, we saw that he enrolled at the University of Illinois in architecture. Well, we figured that, okay, that's the connection. But then we found out that he never graduated. He went for a special course, and he came out in 1895, came back to Kiwani, and set up an architecture office. Well, anyway, along comes uh, Walter Bailey, and we're not sure if they knew each other beforehand or this all happened after he came out, but he, that was his first job, was working as a draftman in Henry Eklund's office, which was at 218 North Tremont Street, which is right across from People's National Bank. Henry Eklund designed the two buildings you'll know today are the uh, Baptist Church and the uh, uh, Old Star Courier Building. But it was also the Armory, it was the uh, YMCA, it was an addition to the Western Tube Office on East 3rd. It was an addition to the Boiler Office out on Franklin. So Henry Eklund, and back then, everything was moving from old wooden buildings that were built on the prairie, you know, to start civilization, and moving into, as the country grew, they were moving into more brick and mortar buildings. And they needed people to design them for churches, for schools, for businesses. And there was a lot of business. There were three architects. At the time Henry came back, from, or Walter came back from school, there was Henry Eklund, John McCullough, and a guy named Beetle. And they all had thriving businesses. So we think that maybe when Henry came back, we found out later that he initially applied at Tuskegee when he got out of the U of I. But they didn't take him right away. He came back. Uh, to Kiwani, worked here, went to Champaign, worked for Spencer and Temple, and then things were happening at Tuskegee. They had a, a, a guy down there that had taken over the, archi or the, uh, the whole building program. Things at Tuskegee were kind of unique. When Booker T. Washington started the school, uh, it was all wooden buildings. It was actually a farm. They had barns, they had hogs. Tuskegee initially was an agricultural school. You've heard of George Washington Carver? The peanut man, well, he was the head of the egg department at Tuskegee, when, and he taught alongside of, of Walter later on. But then he needed buildings, so they brought this guy in named Robert Robinson Taylor, and he was head of the what they call the director of industries. Well, I, I think that he was probably the one that discovered uh, Walter through the U of I, or through the application, and, uh, and, and brought him down there because they were looking for people who were uh, classroom trained and not office trained. Most of the guys like Henry Eklund started out working in an office for somebody, and Walter had, had been academically trained at the University of Illinois, and that meant something to Tuskegee, and that's why they wanted him on board down there. So that was really his launching pad. When he got to, to Tuskegee, Memphis and Chicago and, and so forth were just, you know, and at the same time, when he wound up at Brownsville up in Chicago, which was the black metropolis, he was kind of carried by the wave of this great migration from the south to the north, out of Jim Crow going north. And but after World War I, uh, the African-American population started getting more wealth. They started owning their own businesses, making money, uh, and having ways to spend it. So this Bronzeville neighborhood became sort of a mecca for all of the black industries, businesses, uh, social clubs, everything. So Walter got involved with the Knights of Pythias and went up there, and, and the rest, as they say, is history. But anyway, that was uh, how we, we got to figure out how this guy got where he, he got. Uh, it all started, like I said, all the family lived down in that house on, on Elliott Street that's still there. Uh, it's a nice white, big, it's a big house. You can see where two or three families could easily live in there because at one time there was probably three branches of this family all living down there, Tara's ancestors. Uh, but anyway, uh, are there any questions so far? Feel this is supposed to be a discussion. What house is it they, that they live in? It's 235 Elliott. It's interesting because early on in, the, uh, in all of their news accounts in the paper, and they were a lot of them, uh, Lucinda became very involved in the, in the Bethel AME Church, which is African Methodist Episcopal. But everything was, and when she hosted parties or hosted church meetings and stuff, it was always at, at 235 South Elliott, Steve. I, I, I went even down and checked to see if there was a, <laughs> South, Elliott Street's not more than, you know, it's on both sides of Prospect. It goes north up to Visitation, it goes south down to the hospital. And I, isn't that all there is of Elliott, you city it's officials south. that are here? It, there's no North Elliott or whatever. Well, anyway, these guys thought they were on South Elliott. And so, but then later on, you know, as, as, as Harry and Iola and, and getting closer to Tara's family, it just became 235 Elliott Street. And uh, they were all there, it looks like to me, until uh, uh, Iola passed away, which would have been uh, Genevieve and, and uh, Hayden's mother. And, uh, and, and then Harry was the last, and I think in 1948, I think that's where the family probably left. There was something interesting in 1918 that took place. There was a whole series of articles stretching from January to December of legal notices 
of a, uh, a complaint filed by a Mabel Cummings against the whole uh, Bailey family. There was Walter and Josie, who at the time were in Memphis. There was Henry and Lizzie, his wife. There was Harry and Iola and Lucinda. And it, it looked like it was a foreclosure thing of some kind. But in, in, in the first filing, they, they were demanding that Walter and Josie as non-residents be in court on this date in February. Okay, the next one that comes out, they can't find Henry and Lizzie. They are vagrant, they are, are nowhere to be found, so they're supposed to be ordered to appear in court. Finally, in December, the whole thing is dismissed. Lawsuit dismissed, end of the day. I'm guessing that whoever, well, I'm guessing it's a foreclosure against the house. And in the end, they must have paid it off, settled out of court, whatever, that was the end of it. But that was the whole time I, I saw the whole family's names listed and it was on this foreclosure notice in the paper. <laughs> Little family dirty laundry there, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> also, uh, yes? Uh, what happened to his daughters? Okay, Jeannie, I, that, that, the next guy that's got to talk is, is Steve here. But you, this can weave into, into Steve, at least, yeah. I'm just interested in um, uh, First Baptist Church, of course, I, I passed through there, right? So, which is kind of really cool. Um, did you find archeological or uh, architectural records at all um, uh, about our church tied to him, or how did you make the connection? Uh, we were trying for a while because we thought that maybe if you look at Tompkins Dining Hall and the First Baptist Church, there's a lot of similarities from, from the, 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 those old timers here remember there used to be a dome on top of the Baptist Church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but I think a lot of this was just architectural things that were popular at the time. You look at all these buildings, they all have pillars, they all have uh, Greek revival style, they all have arches, they all have uh, similar characteristics that were, uh, there, there's a real similarity between the Colonel Wolf School in Champaign and the Blish Building out here at Weathersfield, having the little gabled dormers and stuff that used to be on the Blish Building. And, uh, and I, I kind of wonder, if, uh, so what, what happened was we, we tracked down the history on the Baptist Church. They bought the property in 1904, but they didn't start construction until 1905. And by that time, Henry, or Walter rather, had gone on to Champaign. So we were wondering if, if that might be an influence. If I mean, he saw that building being designed probably when he was here, but he wasn't the one that helped design it was what we probably concluded. Then he was on to down there, and then we saw the influences in the Colonel Wolf, you know, from back here in Toronto. So some of the things he saw here, he might have carried on in his own designs. By the time he got to uh, the Brick of Day Church in, in Montgomery and got on to uh, Memphis, he was off on the designing all kinds of, you know, different stuff. The most unique thing, I think, which shows that he actually kept up with the times was one of the last things in 1939, he did the first church of deliverance in Chicago, which is uh, art modern, it's got glass bricks, it's got very, mo it was a hat factory. And this reverend who was starting a radio ministry wanted a big auditorium, he's got a great big multicolored cross hanging from the ceiling, it's designed like a sound studio. And they had, for 80 years, they had national radio broadcasts and gospel music across the United States coming out of that church that Walter had designed. He didn't design it from the ground up, but he took this old hat factory and made it into this nice, modern, one-story, flat church. So anyway, but it, that impressed me, going from the old brick buildings like the Baptist Church and the brick and the Bush building to something that is modern like that, you know, shows that the guy, and by that time he was 59, it was right before he died, 58, 59, I mean, he pretty much, you know, shot his wad at Tuskegee and Memphis and Little Rock and all that. So you'd think, and of course with the, the Pythian eight-story, you know, national headquarters that he built when he first came to Chicago, uh, but he really kicked up. Now, one of, the, one of the, the goals of this whole project was to find descendants of Walter Bailey. We had no idea who was out there. So we formed this thing that uh, uh, Joy called the Scooby-Doo Squad. For those that watch cartoons on Saturday morning, Scooby-Doo is a great dang dog that goes around solving mysteries with these teenagers. <laughs> so that we were the Scooby Squad. But anyway, Steve, now, uh, uh, Steve Morrison here of the Henry County Genealogical Society, Rose Melbourne here in town, and curiously enough, a uh, Marla Millman Roth in California got involved. Where'd you find her at? Uh, I was, I got the cemetery records, and I was wondering where Potter, the Potter's Field part was, where Emmanuel Bailey is buried, and I posted on the You Know You're From Kimwani If Facebook page, and uh, that's where I got Rose Milborn. Uh, her daughter responded on there, and Marla contacted me, and next thing I know, they're, I've got their email addresses, and they're finding lots of different little nuggets of information. Marla was really so helpful with anyway, the day search. Anyway, Steve has done a great deal of research on the family. Well, all of them have, but Steve's probably got the, most, the best collection here, so I'll turn it over to him and let him tell you about 
Here you go, Tara, the Bailey family history. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this on? Well, it's going to the camera, so you've got to okay. speak up anyway. For okay, that's, that's good. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Joy. Thanks, Dave, for putting this thing all together. All I did was sit in my computer and look over a few things for a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more. Uh, what I like to do is when you do family history, how many of you have done that? How many of you are done? <laughs> there's no one that's ever done with family history because there is no end. So when uh, Joy emailed me about this project, I started looking around, found Walter, found some other people. Matter of fact, I think I've got 130 articles out of the Star Courier on my computer about the family, and I'm going to give Tara a book about this. It's 24 pages long with descendants in it and ancestors. And first of all, I liked it. Dave's always asked me about why all these people come up here to Kiwani anyway. Well, there's a guy by the name of Hamilton Way. I'm going to have my wife pass out this thing about Hamilton Way. He's got quite a story, as Walter does. <coughs> has a, a guy by the name of Roy Norton. He didn't, I couldn't figure out how he come into the picture. One of the weirdest things he did was build a golf course out in the Sahara Desert. First one, which that's not hard to believe. But uh, they all have similar type stories. Now, the Hamilton Way that you're seeing there uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on him, but the story, make sure you do read it. He came from Ohio, born in 1828. Uh, he was an adventurer, to say the least. He uh, headed for California in February of 1849. Guess why? <laughs> Gold rush. He got as far as Kansas, got shot in the hip. They left him for dead. Band of half-breed Indians took over and helped him out. Saved him, brought him back to St. Joe. How the guy got back to Ohio, he did. 1850, he takes off again. He's going to make it to California. And we're talking about 1850. And instead of going by land, he goes out to New York gets on a boat, 1,200 other people, goes around the Panama, down by the, you know, around the coast there. 1,200 people, ship floods with 11 feet of water. They're all pumping it out. They ran out of food for 48 days. He finally got to California. He had, you'll find in there, five cents. He become a police officer in Sacramento. Stayed there about three or four years, came back to Kiwani. Now, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, the story is remarkable. It's really hard to believe they traveled around that much, but they did. And Hamilton Way got involved in selling insurance here in about 1860. He's got some ads in the paper about the insurance company. And Civil War comes out, and of course he signs up. They make him a lieutenant, not bad. Then he goes, ends up down in where the Ohio and Mississippi River come together there. And it's around New Madrid, if you've been down through there. And there's a battle called the Island Number 10. And he got discharged in the Army in March of 1862. Well, I've got several obituaries that I've traced down, including George Washington, 
and the newspaper says George Washington Color died yesterday morning of heart trouble. He's about 50 and was born near New Madrid, Missouri, a slave, and remained so till 1862. 1862, that's when they came back to Kiwani. Emily Virginia Lewis is a wife of Frank Lewis. Find out she's a sister of Lucinda. And she's one of the oldest colored residents. She died March the 19th, 1892. She's 49 years old. She was deceased, was sold several times in slavery. She leaves a husband and five children. Next we have Frank Lewis dies. He was one of the earliest colored settlers in Kiwani. He was brought to Kiwani in 1862 by Captain Hamilton Way from Missouri. Frank was born and raised as a slave. After coming to Kiwani, he enlisted in the Union Army and served three years. And some of you might have seen me do that presentation for Channel 6 out at the cemetery where there's the 12 people are buried out there. All these people are the same group. Uh, next, I run across a woman, her name's Alvinia Ward. She was 75 when she died in 1905 from a fall. She came to Kiwani in the 60s as a refugee from the South during the War of the Rebellion. She was born in slavery, was a native of Alabama. Her husband, Oliver, was a Civil War soldier in the 29th. United States Colored Infantry and is buried in Quincy. Died there in the hospital in 1864. One more I'll go over. Uh, Sarah Roberts, she gained her freedom by the Emancipation Proclamation and she was born 1842 in Madison County, Tennessee. She was married to John Roberts in 1856 while still a slave. When President freed the slaves. Mrs. Roberts and her husband came direct to Kiwani in 1862 again. And she often spoke of her slave life and her, she knows her owner who was Peggy Davis. There's a couple of them that I've got owners of the slaves. Um, so still, I don't understand, Steve, what was the draw for Kiwani? Why did they come They to wanted to get out. <laughs> that was their chance to get out. The key, get the key was Captain Way. Captain Hamilton he, uh, Way. He brought about 20 to 25 of them back from New Madrid when he came back to Kiwani. Oh, okay. And it was because of uh, because he was coming to Kiwani that I guess he brought them with him, I would, I would assume. He brought 25 of them, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And this Frank Lewis, he was owned by two Phelps brothers near near. New Madrid, Missouri. So that was the, the important thing there is that that was the beginning of the, of the African-American population in Kiwani. That anybody knows of, there might have been a, you know, here again before the Civil War, they didn't travel in the North that much, so that was probably the seeds of, of you know, the current community. Yeah, one other thing, I run across this, I, and I thought that was pretty unique, that guy bringing all of them up here, and I come across this. He was brought to Kiwani in 1862 by Captain and Mrs. Hamilton Way with a party of about 25 colored people. So his wife evidently went down there, said, you got to get out of the military here, you come back home. So he brought these people with him, and Frank was about 31 at the time and listed for three more years. Now, uh, Walter's dad was Emmanuel Bailey. He was born. 1842 in Alabama, we think. There's another possibility that he might have been born in Missouri. I won't dwell on that too much. Lucinda was born 24 of October 1842 in either Missouri or Kentucky. On two census records she lives those two places. I think it's more likely Missouri, but she did put down Kentucky on one of them. Uh, the census records, I, I'm not going to go over those much, but the first time he's listed, uh, they're listed, Emmanuel and his wife Lucinda are listed in 1870 in Kiwani. He's uh, 
I believe, 25 years old. She's, I believe, uh, 23. She lists herself as a Kentuckian then. And he lists himself this time as a domestic servant. He worked for BF, uh, the, the, uh, Bailey, uh, the, Bailey, the Baker family. Ba Baker, Baker family at one time. Uh, then the next census, I ha have them in 1880. They're living in Kiwani. Emmanuel's age 38, born in Alabama. He didn't list anything about his parents where they were born. She listed herself as bo being born in Missouri this time. <laughs> you sure? Sorry. So before they got to Kiwani, they were slaves. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, I, I, Do we know who owned them? No. Here's the problem. I, I've got enough information. I've looked at a lot. They have slave schedules in 1850 and 1860 in Missouri and the other states. Now, it seems like it should be fairly easy to track them down because most of you know that if he's a Bailey, his owner might have been a Bailey. I think these That's people right. were freed. I think they were kind of out on their own before then. Now, I will tell you that Walter, when his mother died, she put her, he put her place of birth as R-O-W-L-E-S, Missouri. I looked it up. There is no such place. There are streets named that near St. Louis. Her birthplace in another area is listed as Columbia, Missouri, where the University, or, you know, University of Missouri is at. So it, it's a lot of speculation uh, there. I've only got the, the two slave, slave owners, and it, I'll keep working on it, but I just, it's, it's hard to find, it really is. Your, your chance, at, the best chance if you go to a courthouse, if you can find the county and go in there and look at some records. Could Rowles have been like a family plantation, basically, a farm, you know, where they, that was the last name of the owner of the, the that's, slave? That's possible because there are people with that name down there. That's kind of what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. There is no county with that name, but there are people with that name in that same area living there today. Um, he had a brother named Austin Way, married a Anna Butterwick, 1869, and that's where Larry's historical site building's at. And uh, I did, I went over to Cambridge, and I didn't think I'd find it, Emmanuel and Lucinda got married 1869. They have a certified copy of their marriage certificate. Not only a copy, but a certified copy of their marriage certificate. And one of the problems with tracing Lucinda down, she spells her name R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S after that. But her marriage certificate spells it R U N N E L L S, which I did look up that, but it's uh, still haven't had a hit on it. They were married here at the. They couldn't read or write, correct? Uh, somebody might have been writing it as she Reynolds. said it. Reynolds. Just misspelled Reynolds as wrong. Yeah. 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 yeah, I, I, when they got the marriage certificate here. They were married in Kiwani. Yeah. They were married by a guy named of G.W. Arnold, a minister of the gospel. He was the M.E. church here, Methodist Episcopal Church. And looking at this marriage certificate, I don't know whether it's their signature or not. It, it, that, a lot of times you can't, you just can't tell. I'll give you one quick example. This don't have anything to do with this. Remember how many of you had an ancestor came over here from Europe and the name's not right? Well, I always, people always blame Ellis Island for that. Those records didn't come from Ellis Island. 
these people's names were put out there from the port that they left before they got here. I don't know where that gets us, but... <laughs> uh, okay, one other thing I will mention. Emmanuel Bailey might have served in the Civil War. I've got a record here of Samuel Bailey changed to Emmanuel Bailey by Ancestry.com in Company D, 13th Regiment of U.S. Colored Heavy <coughs> Artillery. He's 18, 5 foot 7, complexion's black, eyes blue, hair black. He was born in Mississippi. That's him. That's him, because his father had blue eyes, and we could never figure out how I got blue eyes. No. That's him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And he's a farmer, it says here. Where did he join? Peoria, Illinois. Oh, wow. By Major Norton. Signed up for three years. It says here. So he was, he was there through the duration of the war, then. The, uh, the first time he showed up in Kiwani, well, first of all, in his obituary, it said he died in 1888, but he'd been here 20 years. So that dials it back to 1868. We found in 1876, he was named to a, uh, serve on the jury over in Cambridge for the circuit court. Well, you took my next thing away. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, just to bring up a jury. The jury would disregard that. No. Yeah, 1876, Emmanuel and Wiley Burton, another colored guy, and it says so in there, so that's why I'm telling you, were elected to appointed to serve as pettit juries in the October term of the circuit court. Now there are a lot of articles in the Kiwani papers that the church that Dave's talking about, the AM Bethel Church, there's a lot of articles in there about stuff like that, just tons of them. Like say every time they had a meeting at someone's house, Genevieve Bailey, she's there. Lucinda, Billy Lucinda Jean, Lucinda they're, they're, they're church lady. <laughs> they're all there. Uh, getting back, I'll, I'll, uh, they had a brother, Henry. He's born in 1874. He married an Elizabeth Smith. They usually called her Lizzie. Harry, born in 1879, married a Lola Estelle. And I'll give you this book here, and I've traced that family back. I've even found a picture of, of the, I think it's the great-grandmother and uh, I notice <coughs> Walter, his birth date seems to be January the 11th of 1881. Now, when they list census and stuff like that, they become harder to find. But the state of Illinois from 1916 to 1950, we've had the death certificates for the most part on file and they can get them off the internet. Now, that gets back to or, uh, 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 Walter, he's looking for his and it should have been in there and it's not. But they've got a date and a title for it so I'm going to have to check Springfield. Maybe I can get it, get it from them. Uh, any questions? I don't wanna, I'm not going to go through here and just give you a bunch of dates. Uh, Wanda had asked earlier about um, Walter's daughters. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll get to that. I, w I would say that Emmanuel died in 1888, and I found a short obituary for, obituary for him in the paper. So he, he was li and he'd usually say, Emmanuel Bailey, a respected colored person of Kiwani here, and that's why a lot of those read. Respected. And uh, Dave said that he was in the Glee Club, he was an orator. And in high school at the same time was Harry Bailey, Lois Reynolds, which I'm kind of surprised, and Ed Watson. Ed's also a relative, and he ran a barber shop out in Wethersfield. <coughs> now, bad part about some of this, some of you are familiar with Burr Oak Cemetery in Alsop. Any of you remember the news? few years ago 
where they were finding people had been removed from the cemetery and it was a mess. Yes. That's where a lot of his family is buried. I have not found Walter's wife obituary any place. They can't find her. She was married to, or he was married to Josephine McCurdy from Urbana. An interesting thing about Josephine's brother, who worked in eight, 1918, he was a chief clerk for the president of the University of Illinois. They found, it's listed on his draft card and it's listed in a sense the same way, which I thought that was, for that time period, was really, really something. Uh, Sounds like he married well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any questions any of you have? The daughters. Okay, the daughter, okay. <laughs> the, the daughter, the, um, there, there are two daughters, I'm gonna, Edith and uh, Alberta. Edith and Alberta. One of them was a showgirl. She was a cabaret entertainer. Cabaret entertainer. Oh, <laughs> Genevieve said she was the first person to ever paint their entire body gold. We don't have any documentation to support that. We have a 95 year old lady telling us that. I'm proud of that. And I'm like, okay. Is that one of Walter's sisters? No, that was Walter's daughter. Daughter. daughter yeah. Edith. Yeah. Was Daughters. the cabaret entertainer. No, who's Genevieve? Genevieve's his niece. His niece. Harry's, uh, his brother Harry's daughter. Okay. And uh, to keep up. <laughs> it, it is hard. So it's I'll get, Let me get up here to Walter. Uh, I'm taking this. Walter had two daughters. One was Edith. She was born in 1906 in Champaign, married Preston Howland, 10th July, 1928 in Detroit. Hey. And she died in Chicago in 1957. And Alberta was born 22nd of July, 1914. She appeared in the 1940 Cook County Census, Ward 3. Edith is in that census. She's divorced. She's an entertainer, a cabaret. Now, Alberta's working as a stenographer at a life insurance company. Lucinda, also born in Alabama, is living with him. She's a widow. <laughs> Harry, a brother, or Henry, a brother, 67, from Missouri, widower, he's living with him. And Walter, Albert Walter, is a lodger, age 88, from Illinois, living with him. Now, the thing I real odd about this, as I was finishing up the 1940 census, Walter and his wife, you know, they're both still living in Chicago. It's 1940 census says Walter T. Bailey gives his age. Alberta, his wife, 58, I believe she was, and can't be right. His wife was Josephine, not Alberta. <laughs> so they had a, some, and you run into that occasionally. You just mix up. I would like to, you're looking for another one, one, one more thing here. If you're looking for another person, they Lucinda's brother, which is 30 years difference in age, played for the Negro Leagues in Chicago, and I found these all of these statistics. And it's always mentioned when you read the Kiwani papers. They're talking about Lou. He's always played professional baseball, he was always real good, and he, he's out helping Northeast Park. He's always done something. Well, when I got to looking this up, I found his picture. It's an illustrated picture. This is the team that's called the Chicago Unions. And he's right, standing right, right there. And he's, I've got a copy of this, Tara, for you. So he was, uh, that's pretty good that I think he, he made it. And uh, he played actually two years for them. Then he played in a lot of baseball <coughs> leagues around here. He played in Cambridge. I don't know if I can get anyone here from Cambridge. 
No, okay, I'll tell it then. <laughs> they went over to Cambridge and played, and they made fun of him for being black baseball player. The newspaper did not like that. They said that he was a complete gentleman about it, didn't say anything, and the Cambridge people should be embarrassed for <laughs> acting like that. What yeah. was that? That would have been probably around 1906, 1910. Wow. Okay, I would like to <coughs> give you this book. Okay, got one more, one more story. Here again, illustrating, <clears throat> well, correcting, correcting history, I guess, in a way, because we said that that uh, I was the first person that had heard of, of Walter T. Bailey, and that is not correct. We have found another person who knew about Walter Bailey long before I did, but nobody knew she knew. So Gail, <laughs> come on up here, Gail Gerard. We were sitting out of McDonald's one day, and Gail said, well, you know what, I knew who Walter Bailey was years ago. So I said, well, how in the world was that? Um, I've known who Walter T. Bailey was for about 20 years. Um, in 1997, when I was living in Chicago, um, I lived downtown, and I got to see all these people walking around town in tours, and I asked a docent one day, what do you do? And he said, I'm a docent with the Chicago Architecture Foundation. And I said, I want to do that. <laughs> so uh, I was lucky enough to get into the program. We're at 224 South, I say it like in present tense, <laughs> still loyal to them. Um, they're at 224 South Michigan Avenue, across from the Art Institute. And I worked for an architecture firm there. Uh, I worked for VOA Associates then. And um, I got into this class for 10 weeks on Saturday mornings. We spent the entire morning learning about Chicago architecture, reading books. They gave us lots of books, um, talking to engineers and designers, lots of interior designers, landscape architects, and of course, architects. And so the Chicago history you know, of architecture is monumental, world renowned, <laughs> and I learned a lot. But it was during that time that we were all given AIA books, the American Institute of Architects. And uh, every city has one. You know, you can go through the book, and it's got photographs and all of the detailed, well, general detailed information, who the architects were, when the buildings were built, who the engineers were, um, you know, where it's located, who financed it, that sort of thing. And it was during that time that I became familiar with the building that I had passed several times on South Wabash, and that was uh, Mr. Bailey's church, the church that- Church of Deliverance. The church of Deliverance that um, <clears throat> Dave spoke of. And so I was interested in that because I had been told that that was a black architect and that he was the first licensed architect um, of color in, in Illinois. And then when I looked him up, it said he was from Kiwani. <laughs> Everybody's from Kiwani. And, and I, think, I think everyone on the planet can trace him back to Kiwani. Because you know, almost every conversation, I've lived a lot of different places, almost every conversation starts with, where are you from? And it's like, oh, I'm from a little town you've never heard of. Right. And they all say, yes, I have. Well, yeah. And, yeah. But this was intriguing to me for a lot of reasons, because this was um, a man who was from my hometown, um, an African-American. I knew the Bailey family. It turned out they didn't. But I, I knew Bailey's and Kiwani, and so I got really curious about that. And I, and I'll, and just, I'll finish by saying, because I've told Dave this several times, when Wikipedia came out, and there was a Kiwani page, I would put his name under notable Kiwanians almost weekly, I think, for a couple of months, and every day it would be taken down. <laughs> And I'd put it back on, and it would be taken down. And then I started playing games. I'd put hidden words and paragraphs and stuff just to see if anybody was really proofing. And somebody was, and I don't know who you are, but somebody was maintaining that page very well. And yes, they were finding hidden words like hi in the middle of paragraphs. But the thing that ticked me off was that Mr. Bailey's name kept coming off the, the uh, entry. And I quit. And then after a couple of years, I went on it just out of curiosity, and boom, there he was. And I started to cry. <laughs> I, I was emotional about this. It's like, he needs to be recognized. 
and stop crying. So um, <laughs> when the Waldogs came here a few years ago, I was talking to Larry Locke, and I said, I was in the uh, Historical Society one day, and I said, well, what about Walter T. Bailey? And Larry showed me this rendering. Do you remember that? Somebody in the Waldogs had done a rendering for him. And I said, OK, that needs to be done. Somebody needs to do that. We had that conversation. He said, somebody needs to realize this, uh, this wall dog. And I'm so glad that all of you did. That's, hey, he's remembered now. So. Now we all know about Walter T. Bailey. Uh, any more questions and comments uh, for the greater good? I'm going to run through the thank yous here. We're going to roll the credits. <laughs> first, first of all, thanks to uh, Mike Dewalt and the Kiwanek Historical Society for the wonderful video. Thanks to Rob and Leanne Ballou for our wonderful building and for painting it. They even went and painted that whole wall dark gray. Oh, no. So, we, their house was designed by Henry Eklund in 1895. That, I heard that on, on the video. The interesting thing there is it was 1895 that the story was in the Star Courier that Henry Eklund had just got his certificate from a special course he took at the U of I. So one of the first things he did was come back and design the house on South Tremont where the Baloo's now live. How's that? <laughs> anyway, Dr. Great Dane for providing the steel panel and for all the volunteers, some of whom are here tonight back there, uh, for putting it up, screwing it in the wall. This one, uh, like Neville Brand and like Roger Riemann, are on steel panels that are attached to the wall and they will come off if the building is sold or if something happens or whatever. So we really do appreciate Great Dane doing that. That's, that's a big help. Uh, plus, it makes a nicer presentation, I think, we're just painting it on the bricks. Anyway, uh, our major donors, uh, uh, Gail mentioned the American Institute of Architects. Uh, is that fellow coming Sunday? Uh, I've been told that they are. I will just kind of, you know, the, uh, travel. The executive so. director from Springfield, uh, Mike Waldinger, they donated $2,500. They were the major donor. Uh, there was a branch in Springfield of the American Association of Architects that donated uh, 500. The University of Illinois donated $1,000. By gosh, they darn well better. <laughs> the one thing, we, we got a whole raft of stuff from the U of I archives and from other places, and Walter really, truly did love the University of Illinois. He stayed in touch, he went to all the football games, had season passes, went to every alumni reunion, every homecoming, and uh, corresponded continually. He would send them back pictures and postcards and things with his, uh, you know, stuff that he'd done on it, and was in all the alumni directors, and they, in turn, uh, think a lot of him. He is part of their history. Uh, like I said, when she called down to the U of I, just cold called the U of I switchboard, you know, even the operator knew who Walter T. Bailey was. So, also the Prairie Chicken Festival, thank you, they donated 500 uh, to the mural. And there were several private uh, donations of, of $1,000 and $500. And of course, to Marcus Throneberg in Center City for hosting us tonight. Marcus wants us to let you know that this basically is, is a teen center on Friday and Saturday night. Uh, and uh, but he says it's available now that we're not in the boss office building isn't available this is available for public events like this so look around you know mark it down get get Marcus's phone number and because uh, he wants it to be used you know during the week not just on, on weekends anything from you Joy we have one more sponsor though that's on the list um, boss manufacturing was a sponsor of, of the mural uh, that came about because Genevieve told us that w the reason why she moved to Los Angeles was there wasn't that many employment opportunities for African Americans in the area. But the major employers were John Deere, if you could get all the way out to Moline, but locally Walworth, or she said the steel plant, we've kind of deduced that it's Walworth, and Boss. Boss was a way to make good, a good living um, back then. So when we, we let them know about that, because they're having their 125th anniversary this year, and they uh, donated. Money to the I think it was $300. Yeah. Well, speaking of fundraising, too, uh, the, uh, the, the, temp the thing that blew me when Joy told me down the rabbit hole was how in the world are you going to raise $10,000 for this thing in six months? Because she started last fall, but it was like in January before I got on board. One thing, obviously, you see the architects and the U of I really got behind this. They're about half of the $10,000 right there. But uh, uh, what amazed me is that. Uh, that we can take something like this and, and bring it back here to Kiwani with this kind of money. Uh, is there anything else that you want to say? Uh, 
Yeah, the, uh, no, no, I just spaced out. Um, <laughs> I just forgot what it was. It's such a sunburn. Yeah, it's, it's been really hot, bakey kind of. Oh, oh. oh. the dedication's at 2 o'clock on Sunday. Yes. And there's all kinds of curry chicken festival activities going on Friday, and, mainly Saturday is the big day. Uh, downtown's going to be a car show here. There's going to be chalk art over at the station house. Uh, going to be all kinds of art show. Where's the art show? The Elks Club? And there'll be kids' activities in here and, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, but anyway, what uh, what I think we need to do is, is we've got a suggestion box over here. If you have any ideas for murals, please write them down. Uh, they're looking for ones in the future. Uh, it'd be nice, I think, personally, this is number 17. It would be nice to hit 20, say, in the next five or six years, every other year, every year of the year. And it, it can happen. I mean, uh, she got busy and, and got people on board with GoFundMe. That makes it all of this possible. And uh, you just need somebody to kind of pull it together, come up with an idea. And uh, if you're looking for, looking for donations, oh, I know what I was going to say. The, the goal was reached on June the 24th, on a Sunday, at 8.05 p.m., when Bill and Lori Christensen co-funded $300. And that took it over 10000 Then we were real. Then we had to get busy. We're really going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> We'd already been getting some stuff lined up, but we didn't have, well, we had 9000 then we pretty much know we were going to make it. But then all the extra money that you have raised since then and what comes in here is going to go into the maintenance fund for the existing murals, for upkeep and that sort of thing. And maybe for another mural later on. I don't know. This is all through the Prairie Chicken Festival. But they're doing wonderful things. This is all about Kiwani history. This is something that a lot of towns really don't have. I'll tell you one more story and then I'll let you go. Was that Several years ago, we got contacted there at the Star Career by the state librarian from the Tennessee State Library. They were looking for information on a guy called Stiles Hutchins. He was a black barber in Kiwani, had a big history in Tennessee. I won't go into all that. But anyway, she wanted information on, on his life here in Kiwani. We came up with stuff. Steve Morrison went down to Mont Mattoon, where he moved after he left here, got a picture of the guy's grave. We sent that to her, got a picture of his house out by the Walworth, sent that to her. And she emails back and she says, who the heck are you guys? <laughs> she said, we send requests from Nashville here all over the United States. We very seldom even get a response. And she said, when we do, it's somebody that says, I don't know. <laughs> but we just, we had this wonderful group of people here, you know, Larry and the Historical Society, Steve and the Genealogical Society. We have a wonderful library uh, that has a lot of resources. Uh, we have people like Joy that are interested in the artistic angle of things. We have so many people that can find things around here. I'm just, I'm just the, the messenger. People keep thinking I'm so smart, baloney. I just, I'm the mouthpiece, I guess. <laughs> Tell the story. But yeah, but, uh, and I enjoy digging into these things. I enjoy the archaeology of history, not telling stories that have been told before, but finding right. stories that haven't been told for a long time or news that, like, this is, why, this is perfect. This is why I've enjoyed doing this in my retirement, is that it's something that we didn't know that we now know that we can leave for future generations, and it's all on the wall down there. And you remember the History Museum's open. Yes. Tomorrow, tomorrow, one to four and Saturday, 10 to 4. And if you've been there before, you want to come back again because Mike DeWall's doing all kinds of great things. They've done some remodeling and they've got a lot of new, all of new things. Well. Yeah, this video is going to be, Mike has rearranged the, uh, the website, Kiwana, it's kiwanahistory.com. Kiwana and uh, has a lot of uh, photo and video galleries on there that you if, you, if you're sitting there on a Sunday afternoon and it's 110 outside and you don't <laughs> want to go anywhere, go on the website, click on a bunch of galleries, look at the photos from Kiwani in 1975, or there's a neat one he did on the boss anniversary, stuff like that. And he did it like these. Walworth right? newsletters from 1907. The Walworth newsletters. <laughs> they're, all, they're all done with a nice nice narration and some music. And, you know, it's not it's not Academy Award winning. I'm oh, sorry, Mike, it's not Academy Award winning. <laughs> but he's got a really great narration voice. <laughs> but, you know, it is, it, it, it is something slick that you don't find in a lot of towns this size that we, we have here now. And uh, it, it's all available. Uh, and I like the stuff of the digital access of the library. That was the Historical Society, the Library, and the Genealogical Society. I finally decided to knuckle, knuckle down. All donations paid for that whole thing. They're up to 1979 now, I believe. And if they get more money, they'll just march forward. From 1857 all the way to 1979, if your name was ever in the Star Courier, we can find it. Oh, that is you can find it. Huh? You can find it. Yeah, somebody you else can find it. Right. You right. can find you it yourself. You don't have to call Steve yeah. to look it up. No, but exactly. Yeah, there's but somebody. he'll give you his phone number. For anybody. <laughs> I remembered what I was going to say earlier. 
This year, so while we didn't do Walter Bailey as a mural five years ago, this year has really become the year of Walter Bailey, not just because of what we did here in Kiwani, not just because Tara's here. At the beginning of the year in January in Chicago, the First Church of Deliverance was listed as a Chicago landmark, and they were given a grant to renovate the church and do some needed updates. I started searching, you know, we just keep searching down that rabbit hole, and in June, I was like, you know, I haven't searched W.T. Bailey. He was listed on some images I'd seen as W.T. Bailey, and I'm like, I haven't really just sat there and Googled and seen how many Google searches come, you know, how many different pages I can go through. When I did that, it was June 2nd. On June 1st, an article came out in Little Rock, Arkansas. The Mosaic Templar, or, I always screwed up, Mosaic Temple Cultural Center was just the day before listed as a, on the National Register of Historic Places. Hmm. Walter designed that building too. So he's got that one at the beginning of the year. In the middle of the year, he's got this other one. And then he's got this mural and his family members. And it just has cascaded into this just awesome coincidence of you know, Walter Bailey, but in, in a way that you couldn't plan any of this. Well, Larry and I was talking today too. Somewhere in all of this mess, uh, we learned that Walter preferred professionally to be known as W.T. Bailey, mm -hmm. like you said. And Larry reminded me that all of the professional people of the time wanted to use their initials. Think of Double E. Baker or V.F. Baker. Everybody had an initial. The, the, head of the, the head of the architecture department at the U of I, that was Walter's teacher, was a, now he's famous, he was the founder of the department. His name is N. Clifford Ricker, Nathan Ricker. But anyway, he, it had to be N. Clifford Ricker, you know, he had to get, so w, if you're gonna be real official, call it W.T. Baker. <laughs> So, but that's, that, that's how we found him down in Little Rock. All of his stuff out of Memphis. He did a lot of work in Arkansas, but all of it out of Memphis. In his Memphis office was listed as W.T. Bailey. And on his cards, it said he had a specialty in designing churches. Mm -hmm. so, so that was a big... Huh? Yeah, he had a nickname listed oh, in his obituary yeah. as Butter Bailey. Butter, oh. Bailey. Oh. Butter <laughs> Bailey. Yep, Butter. You can't, you can't... He was a I, fullback I, on football. I don't care what you say about everybody reading the Star Career obituaries. You can't always believe what you're reading the obituaries because they're <laughs> written by the kids, okay? <laughs> and it's what the kids were told. So in the obituary, in Lawrence's obituary, it says he was the greatest black athlete in the history of Kiwani High School. You couldn't tell. As of 1941. Yeah, <laughs> as of 1941. And he was known as Butter Bailey. You couldn't tackle him. Huh? He was a he was a fullback. You couldn't he couldn't tackle him. Probably he, was, he was too smooth. Yeah. And I don't I don't doubt that his nickname was Butter Bailey. Uh, well, and, and uh, uh, Genevieve Genevieve is listed in the 1942 yearbook. That's the year she graduated. And uh, it, under her name, it says "Doggone Dependable." <laughs> there she is at 95, still ranking the first. She's going. Place. They had it right. And uh, Alberta, the daughter, the youngest daughter. I don't have this one printed out because it's a Google book, and I'd have to somehow get a hold of it. But it is a, uh, a petition for 1940 in Chicago. So I'm looking up their address, 4322 Prairie Avenue on, in Chicago. But it is, um, she's on a, a petition to start a communist party in <laughs> Illinois, in Chicago. And this, and even cool. better, yeah, when That's you're looking through. Is that the cabaret dance the cabaret entertainment? No, this is the other, the younger sister. She's like 13 years younger. And this, this thing is, is a book that was in Spain. Like, it's from the Madrid library that they had uploaded. I don't know why it's there. But well, it has a stamp in it from the Un-American Activities Committee. Here again, yeah. look, and because she was an entertainer, that's probably how she got on there. Keep in mind the context of time, like with the U of I in 1900 and not 2018. In 1940, whatever, this is pre-McCarthy era, you know, that was the Un-American Activities Committee. Yeah. And in Hollywood, it was socially acceptable to be a member that it wasn't the Communist Party we learned to fear, you know, during the 60s. But uh, so back then, uh, <laughs> Some of the old guys out there in McDonald's talk about when their grandfathers belonged to the KKK. Well, back in back in 1900, it was a secret society, and they had their actually somebody told me they hated Catholics more than they hated you know, African Americans. Another dig for the Catholics, there, Steve. <laughs> so but, times but, change. So, yeah, times change. You guess what? You kind of back up like we did with Yeah, in the context of the time, in the yeah. 40s, the Communist Party was probably in a way more of a proto civil rights. You know, if you're looked at as a second-class citizen, hey, everybody being equal, that sounds like a great thing, right? So why not? So she, when they came to her door, she signed on to the petition, but, um, and then now got wrapped up in McCarthyism. <laughs> but she lived until 1997. Uh, we do have her, her death record, and 96 or 97. So she was, she'd been around for quite a while. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please look through the folder. It was awesome.